Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I see some faces on the screen. It's great to see faces versus just names. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm the director of OSHA Lifelong Learning here at Cal State Channel Islands. I'm going to introduce our presenter this afternoon. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted just to make sure we do we did um, share this uh, free seminar to the community. So we might have people on here that are not um, OLLI members or OLLI students. So I want to make sure that everyone knows who OLLI is. OLLI is a program here at Cal State Channel Islands that helps uh, individuals that are 50 years and older to take classes here on the campus with us <clears throat> and other locations in Ventura County uh, that are the joy of uh, learning. Uh, we have classes in art, history, um, politics, um, music, the list goes on and on and on. In the link that I'm going to put in our chat, it has a link to our main page of our website, and you're welcome to take a look at our catalog, our classes registration open today. So we're looking forward to having some uh, great classes here in our um, future. Uh, great classes coming up in our uh, spring two catalog. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, at this point, I want to um, share that this seminar is uh, free to our members and we continue to look for other offerings that are free. In May, we're gonna be offering a, a series for the first time of three seminars and there's more to come on the, on the um, what they're about, so that's coming. With that being said, I don't wanna take any more time. I wanna share, uh, introduce Dr. Baker, uh, who is a general surgeon and is also retired from the US Navy with the rank of Rear Admiral. He has experience in contingency planning, operations, and multinational exercises. He, he has been to the Ukraine uh, during this unfortunate time um, in Ukraine, and today he's going to be talking about the casualty care in Ukraine, um, helping Ukrainians defend themselves and their homeland. So at this point, uh, at this point, I would like to take let the microphone go to Dr. Baker to go ahead and give this presentation that is set for an hour and a half. Thank you, Daniel, for a nice introduction. And thank you all for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I know everybody has a busy life, but what's going on in Ukraine is very important. And I've been fortunate enough, as Daniel mentioned, to go there several times to teach, and I will be going back shortly. So I want to take you through a little tour of my knowledge of Ukraine, but I want to start with some history and geography and some politics uh, before I come to the part where I teach casualty care, uh, because I think you need a little backgrounder. Uh, to see where I went and, and what I encountered and, and how I feel about it. So let's start with, you know, why is a general surgeon traveling to Ukraine during a war and lecturing, teaching? Um, I was, I had this parallel second career, and I suspect it has something to do with having been contacted to do the job that I did. Many of you know this from before, that uh, I decided to serve my country after my medical school, after my surgery training, after my fellowship. I decided I needed to do something for my country. And ultimately I selected on the Navy. And this is me being sworn in when I was quite a bit younger. Uh, and this is my very first file photo at my first promotion to Lieutenant Commander. I have a fairly uh, plain looking blue Navy jacket on with two and a half stripes. And when I finished, I had picked up a little color along the way, uh, a couple of personal awards, uh, quite a few deployment ribbons, uh, a warfare device above my ribbons that qualifies me to command small boats and coastal and river patrol. And I had the broad stripe of a rear admiral. So uh, what I thought was gonna be two or three years turned out to be quite a bit longer and it's shaped a lot of, of what I got to experience. So Europe's been at peace for 75 years. I never expected anything like this in my lifetime. How did this happen? Well, I like to quote Mark Twain about this, that he said, God created war so that Americans would learn geography. And for those of you who didn't know where these places were uh, a year ago plus, you know, we're now almost just past the one year anniversary, you know them now. Um, but we have to look at some of the politics too. Why did Putin decide to attack Ukraine? I mean, what was going on with him? Well, um, you know, he's made several claims that we have to assess, one of which is that Ukraine has always been a part of Russia. And he's also said that Ukrainians are actually Russians. And so we're going to take this apart and dissect it historically just a little bit and geographically. Depending on when you look at the map, Ukraine has been part of many countries. This is a 1619 map 
of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And if you look here, the entire area that is in color here, um, Ukraine is down at about five o'clock, what's today's Ukraine. Above it is Belarus, a couple of the Baltic states up here, and, and Poland. You know, this was all part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, it wasn't part of Russia. Uh, it was really quite European oriented in, the, in that era. Um, depending on where you are, you know, Ukraine here is here today, but these borders have shifted many times, uh, particularly. So, you know, again, is it historically really part of Russia or is it a separate country with a separate language and a separate history? Uh, I think that's really the case. Um, you know, at the end of World War II, what happened, this is a map of uh, before the collapse of the Soviet republics. Uh, one here in red is Russia. There's a reason why it, on Rorschach, it reminds me of a wolf gobbling other countries. Uh, but over here, six is Ukraine, in modern day Ukraine, where I just put up a blue arrow. Uh, some of these other countries you're familiar with, the Baltics that were part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth um, and the stands. A lot of these countries broke away from the Soviet Union. They all wanted to be independent. And interestingly enough, uh, not only did they want to be independent like Ukraine, which actually had a declaration of independence and had a vote in 1991 with 90% voting in favor of independence, 84% electoral participation. We could use that in this country. Um, and the newly elected president signed an accord with Russia and Belarus that the Soviet Union no longer existed. And that now that this was three separate countries. And in 1994, there was the Budapest Memorandum, which between the US, United Kingdom and Russia would guarantee Ukraine's security and sovereign borders. They did that in order to get Ukraine to secure and give up their nuclear weapons. Um, that's one of the reasons why we are supporting them today. We guaranteed their security in 1994. Obviously, Russia doesn't really care about that degree. Um, but when we get past the fall of the Soviet Union, you know what we have now is the Russian Federation is here, Belarus is here, Ukraine. I just put a blue star if you're watching, it's right here in the center of your screen. Um, and these other countries, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Georgia, you know, a lot of them all became independent and ultimately they joined NATO, interestingly enough, because they're afraid of Russia. So back to Ukraine was always part of Russia. So the fact of the matter is, uh, this is Ukraine today, filling all the colors of the map, uh, the part that you saw in, 1600s and 1700s by the czars is here in yellow. Uh, Lenin added a bit in 1922. Khrushchev added Crimea in 1954. Stalin did a little additions, redrew the map in 39 and 45 um, in between all the other terrible things. So, you know, these, these are all areas that the Soviet Union leadership tacked onto Ukraine. So the borders shifted many, many times over the centuries. Um, but, you know, since 1991, it's been a sovereign state. It's been part of many countries and many empires, and the borders changed often, but 1991, it's, it's sovereign. So are the Ukrainians Russians, like Putin claims? Well, I want to introduce you to a brief clip of Yuval Harari, a famous historian. Let's see what he says. The most crucial thing to know is that Ukrainians are not Russians, <clears throat> and that Ukraine is an ancient independent nation. Ukraine has a history of more than a thousand years. Kyiv was a major metropolis and cultural center when Moscow was not even a village. Uh, for centuries, Kyiv was looking westwards and was a part of a union with Lithuania and Poland. His belief was at least that he just needs to uh, uh, invade. The Lensky will flee. Uh, the government will collapse, the army would lay down its arms, and the Ukrainian people would welcome uh, the Russian liberators throwing flowers on them. Those babushkas were throwing something other than flowers. They were throwing Molotov cocktails. The Ukrainians are a very real nation. They are fiercely independent. They don't want to be part of Russia. They will fight like hell. And we've seen that. They clearly are putting up a thing. So if we look at Putin's stated reasons, Ukraine's always been part of Russia. Not true. Ukrainians are actually Russians, not. Um, Ukraine is controlled by Nazis. You know, that's crazy propaganda. We heard his foreign minister at the G20 conference this week say that Ukraine started the war, and the whole audience started laughing. 
I mean, they just say stuff. One of the other big claims that you really need to get your arms wrapped around is that NATO's getting too close and somehow threatens Russia, even though it's a defensive uh, organization, and that, God forbid, Ukraine might someday join NATO. And somehow that threatens Russia. So Putin says NATO is getting too close. Well, when you look at the map, in dark blue are the countries that before the collapse of the Soviet Union were part of NATO. So you can see Great Britain, you can see France, Germany, Italy, Turkey. Uh, the lighter purple colors here, one through 14, are countries that left the USSR, became independent, and joined NATO. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Poland, the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Um, Ukraine is here. Is, is it going to matter? Is it could somehow that makes NATO too close? Well, you know, it's nonsense because there's a border. I just put this blue arrow up here uh, at the top of the screen near number one and number two. NATO already borders Russia. So that's just, you know, one more kind of bogus, crazy claim. Turkey down here is exceedingly close to Russia. It's also a NATO partner. Um, and very interesting. I'm just going to put up this red arrow again right in the middle of your screen. You see that little blank space there uh, between three and four? you know, between Lithuania and Poland, that is Kaliningrad. It's part of Russia. It's a naval base with nuclear submarines and nuclear weapons, and it's right in the middle of NATO. I don't know how much closer NATO can get to Russia or vice versa when you have a piece of Russia right in the middle of NATO. Um, you know, that that's the, the site. If you read the hunt for Red October, I think that's where the, the ship departed from uh, in that book and movie. But, you know, it's right there. So that claim is, is pretty crazy. Uh, what did happen is that previous neutral Finland and Sweden have rushed to join NATO. They're very worried now. Uh, we've got new Ukraine here, but, you know, up at the top of the screen, um, we now see that Sweden and Finland are joining. Finland probably is going to get in a little faster because Turkey has thrown a few roadblocks on Sweden, but they know the Russians are coming. Uh, the Finns have fought them before, uh, just before World War II. And, you know, they've been preparing for this for decades. They want to be part of NATO. Uh, NATO, again, it's a defensive organization. Somehow I don't see, uh, you know, these countries like Hungary, Romania, and Luxembourg teaming up and invading Russia. I mean, that's not the purpose of NATO. NATO is there because everybody fears Russia. And with good reason. We've seen them do this number of times. And again, you've got Kaliningrad right here in the middle of NATO. So is NATO possibly going to get too close to Russia? They're already intertwined. So why did they invade? Well, I think Putin wants to erase the humiliation of the Soviet collapse, regain control of a separatist republic, which wants to be a powerful force on the world stage. It's kind of backfired on him, I think. He wants to restore the glory of the Russian empire. And he often compares himself to Peter the Great. He feels that he's going to recreate uh, this great country and this great force on the world stage and that Russia will be a big player. But one of the other reasons why Ukraine really matters, uh, if you go to business school, they teach you location, 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 and follow the money. Uh, if you follow the money, uh, these are the pipelines on this map. Ukraine is here in the middle of the map, colored yellow. Russia is like a more of a tan color. These are all oil and gas pipelines that go right through Ukraine to feed Europe, Germany, France, Italy. These countries are very dependent on Russian gas and oil before this conflict. And Russia had to pay a tax to ship their gas across Ukraine. Interesting. Uh, it's a very big deal. They also have a lot of natural resources. They have a lot of uranium ore, believe it or not. They are second in the world of titanium ore reserves, second in Europe titanium, second in the world with manganese. Uh, they have all kinds of stuff, iron ore, tons and stuff. If you look at a, a map, you can get out of a, a book, you know, telling you about the all the things in uh, it can be mined and, and done out of the Ukrainian soil. There's a lot of stuff. And it's everything from sulfur and potash to salt and quartz, along with the other things I mentioned. So it's a very, very, very rich country in terms of resources. It's also a very, very rich country that up till now is meeting the food needs of about 600 million people around the world. Uh, Ukrainian agriculture was spectacularly good. Uh, they were shipping food to China, to India, to Turkey, to Africa, all through Europe, uh, all kinds of things, corn and sunflower oil and wheat, soybeans. Um, Ukrainian agriculture was spectacular before the war. It's still pretty good, but it's been hurt, uh, as has the industry. 
Um, but most important, why did Putin really go after Ukraine? Um, he can't tolerate a free and democratic country next door. So I want to introduce you to former ambassador Ivo Dalder, who was our ambassador to NATO uh, years ago. And he has something to say about this. Vladimir Putin's objective is to keep Ukraine, the second largest country on the continent, from making common cause with the democracies of Europe. What motivates Putin is a concern about the independence of Ukraine, a worry that a, a functioning, successful, prosperous democracy in Ukraine. A worry that a functioning, successful, prosperous prosperous democracy in Ukraine undermines Putin's rule. Poses a direct threat to his rule because it will give people in Russia the idea that they too could enjoy what Ukraine uh, enjoys and rise up against his autocratic rule. So, you know, the whole concept, whether NATO's too close or whatever it is that Putin's putting out there to start the war, not true, wanted to go through it because everybody needs to realize it's nonsense, along with the fact that NATO, uh, Ukraine did not start the war. So um, this is part of the legacy of Vladimir Putin, seeing himself as recreating an empire. He, 2007, he stated the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century, which is interesting. I'm only an amateur historian, but there are millions that died in World War I, millions died in World War II. There was the Great Depression. Uh, there was the Holodar when millions starved in Ukraine because of Stalin. Uh, there was the 1918 to 22 flu epidemic that may have accounted for as many as 50 million deaths around the world. But, but he thinks the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe, that when it came apart, that was the, the big problem. So what does he do? It's a war, stupid. It's not a special military operation. You've heard a lot of people. Ее цель – защита людей, которые на протяжении восьми лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима. He's the war criminal. There's no genocide till those Russians invaded. He's the war criminal. Кто бы не пытался помешать нам, а тем более создать угрозы для нашей страны, для нашей Nobody is threatening Russia. He just makes it... народа должны знать, что ответ России будет незамедлительным и приведет вас к таким последствиям, с которыми вы в своей истории еще никогда не сталкивались. That's his first nuclear threat right there. He's saying you'll face consequences like you've never seen. This is the guy who's a really big threat. Мы готовы к любому развитию событий. So I'd like to quote the Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island when they were responding to the ship, the Moskva. Um, their response, you know, doing my best as a sailor, I'm trying not to swear because uh, we're doing a college class. But these 18 guys stood up to the battle cruiser, uh, Moskva, and on the radio transmitted this very clear message, which hopefully is going to looks like it's going to be a postage stamp maybe in Ukraine. We'll see. Um, so let's look at his special military operation. When Vladimir Putin invaded a peaceful Ukraine, his brutal shock troops committed hideous war crimes against women, children, and the elderly. He bombed cities, towns, and villages. So I guess if I can't win, I can blow up the infrastructure and punish the civilians and ruin the country. I guess that's where he's at these days. So um, I want to bring in, along with, you know, I, I bring in a couple of my friends during this lecture because they are experts. My friend and shipmate Malcolm Nance is fighting with the International Legion in Ukraine. Um, introducing you to them, it's 25,000 volunteers from over 50 countries around the world came to fight for Ukraine. They get background checks and psych evals. It's a little more formal than the Wagner group that from Russia that goes around emptying out the prisons. Um, he came home for a week in August to promote his new book written before the war started. And of course, I had to go to his lecture. Um, book's pretty interesting. It's about militias and domestic terrorists and uh, the Trump insurgency. And, and you know, you can tell he's a pretty cheerful guy. We've been friends for for long, long time. We had to go out for a drink. I learned for the first time ever what a French 75 was. I had to look it up in Wikipedia. But I want you to meet my friend and shipmate, Malcolm Nance. He's an author, commentator, Navy intelligence officer. He's done a lot of things in his career. He has a lot to say. Early on in the war. And I said this on MSNBC. I said, 
these guys are going to fight. I can tell by the look in this man's eye, right. he is ready to kick Russian ass. And I said this on one of the MSNBC shows about three or four days before the invasion. And they were like, well, you know, the invasion will be quick. They'll right. lose rather fast. And I said, hey, let me tell you something. They I were talking in... about the Ukrainians losing. Right. They the said Ukrainians the Ukrainians, losing... he would be in there within two weeks. It would all be over. Right. Yeah. Kiev would be taken in right. 72 hours. And, and I you still some... believe that, that the sure. Ukrainians are going to win. Sure. So, you know, I mean, I'm a member of the International Legion. I, you know, I, I am with the forces that are fighting the Russians on the front line on the Eastern Front. Sure. Definitively without any question, is going to lose this war. We're going to hear from Malcolm again later in this uh, story. But Malcolm predicted the Ukrainian victory. He was the only one on the news stations that had faith in them. And how did the Ukrainians do? The Ukrainians put their courageous soldiers in the line of fire. With great sacrifice, this alliance broke the invasion, pushed it back, liberated millions. Victory for Ukraine is in sight. There's a lot of hope, but there's so much more to be done. So what has Putin achieved? Well, he's killed thousands of Ukrainians, military and civilian. 13 million Ukrainians have been displaced from their homes. More than six and a half of them uh, are refugees across Europe. And that's a staggering number. So around here, you know, we have 50,000 people evacuated because of a natural disaster. Um, you know, the roads were packed. Uh, you couldn't find a place to sleep for a lot of people. I mean, it was just, so how can you imagine uh, 13 million people displaced from their homes. It, it's terrible. Uh, there's numbers from the UN uh, groups that are trying to monitor this that somewhere between one and a half and three million Ukrainians have been kidnapped from Donetsk and Luhansk back into Russia. Uh, a lot of people, you know, kind of got taken by bus to these filtration camps. The other thing that happened to the Ukraine is they lost a big part of their gross domestic product. So their economy is really crushed right now. Uh, I suspect that's happening a little bit to Russia too. It's just they're probably not uh, letting the word out. But what else happened? You know, thousands and thousands of people taken by surprise and, you know, winding up um, having their lives terminated unfairly very early. Um, so his other achievements, I heard an estimate this morning, maybe as many as 250,000 Russian casualties. Uh, they just keep feeding guys into the meat grinder. They've lost over 4,000 armored vehicles. You don't rebuild those overnight. Um, it, on the other side of the coin, 130,000 Ukrainian buildings are destroyed by bombs and rockets. 800 Ukrainian hospitals have been damaged and 127 destroyed uh, as of December. And that number keeps going up. So, you know, if this was your house and they, you know, got hit by the bomb, you're there with your shovel and whatever, and you're going to try and put your life back together. It's pretty difficult. If this was your apartment building, uh, same thing. And and there's worse. So, you know, this is uh, footage of the apartment building in Dnipro. I believe the final death toll was about 47. Uh, 41 were killed immediately. Uh, it took the middle out of the apartment building. It's very strange that hospitals and apartment buildings and things like that are the targets for guided missiles. Um, there was a family living in that flat that you just saw. Uh, unfortunately, um, the father was killed uh, during the missile strike. The family is now displaced, uh, plus they've lost dad. I mean, it's just a staggering thing. Um, as of this morning, according to the Ukrainian health minister, 1,218 Ukrainian health facilities have been damaged, including 540 hospitals. He said 173 hospitals were totally destroyed and turned into piles of stones. So uh, as of about two weeks ago, about a week ago. Sir, I apologize for interrupting. This is Daniel. Uh, if you guys received an, uh, a personal message about getting um, take meeting notes for you, please do not click on the link. Uh, the person has left, I believe, the Zoom, but do not click on the link if it's asking you to take notes. Uh, we do not take notes um, in this program or record this besides us. Sorry about that for interrupting, but I'm getting messages on the side. I just wanted to make an announcement. Very good. Thank you for bringing that up. So, you know, this this is a hospital uh, hit hit by a rocket, and this is a maternity hospital. You saw some pictures in Mariupol of the pregnant patients and uh, delivery and postpartum patients being evacuated. I mean, 
what, what a terrible thing. Um, you know, this is not the way your hospital looks. Think about those numbers, a thousand plus hospitals damaged. Uh, in your neighborhood, if you lost one hospital, how hard would it be to take care of grandma's chest pain or your kid's appendicitis? Uh, not to mention the fact that the emergency room is already stacked with casualties from the conflict. I mean, you know, you can't lose these facilities and rebuild them overnight. Um, should the war be negotiated to, a, you know, some kind of an armistice? I'm going to bring in Gary Kasparov. You may know him as the chess grandmaster, but he became an anti-Putin activist uh, several years ago. He spent some time in jail for it. Uh, he wrote a book called Winter is Coming. He said that he must be stopped because he's just going to keep coming at after the West. I want you to hear what he says about negotiating. Ukraine is now on the front line of the war, global war of freedom against tyranny. Brave Ukrainians are fighting like hell and dying right now to remind us not to take liberty for granted. Putin, like every dictator before him, underestimated the free will of free people. They deserve every weapon, every resource to win this war because they're fighting for us, not only for the whole and free Ukraine. The price of stopping a dictator always goes up with every delay, every hesitation. Meeting evil halfway, it's still a victory for evil. What kind of civilization we are fighting for if we allow war crimes and genocide again? Sometimes you have to fight for what you believe or you lose it. This is not chess. There are no draws, no compromises in our battle with true evil. It's win or lose. And so we must fight. And so we must win. Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine. Glory to freedom. Thank you. You know, and if you look at uh, the trend lines, you know, if there's an armistice, you know, Russians probably would just retool and come at them again. Who knows? Uh, depends on what kind of guarantees the West could put down on the chessboard. I'm not a diplomat, but I think he's a very sharp guy and it's worth hearing what he has to say. What happens if Putin's successful? You know, he's got a country that's a much bigger population. Uh, it's, the military is more than seven times the size of Ukraine's military. Uh, well, you know, I mentioned Kaliningrad on the map. I think if he was successful there, Kaliningrad might be his next stop. Moldova, where they're already causing a lot of trouble, uh, sort of underneath the surface, where Russian troops are already stationed, would be targets. Remember, I showed you this map where the Baltic states are, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Kaliningrad is right here with the red arrow, Poland. Um, you know, I, I think if the Russians were to win Ukraine or to get a major thing, they'd be coming over here to reestablish the land bridge. And the second place they'd be hitting, if you're looking at the map, this is a map of Ukraine, conflict Ukraine. And here in this sort of pinkish red color are all the areas where there's currently conflict. Russians have invaded this part of Ukraine. Um, and I think over here, where I just put this red arrow in Moldova, this little strip has been occupied by Russian soldiers uh, with one of those things of they're protecting Russian speaking people in that part of Moldova. But Moldova is not part of NATO, so they're very vulnerable. And I could see if I were a strategist looking at this map where I just put this blue arrow, you want to close this land bridge. You want to close the access to the port of Odessa uh, and you want to take Moldova. So um, those would be the next things had things worked out well. So. Now, why did I go teach in a conflict zone? Well, during my career, uh, I was I felt real strongly um, that supporting democracy is important. Democracy under attack anywhere, I feel, is an attack on democracy everywhere. And we really need to support, just like Gary Kasparov says, we're fighting evil, and if he wins, they're going to keep coming at us. We know that Russia's invasion of Ukraine had no basis in fact. I explained some of the things we talk about. Ukrainians are fighting for their homeland. I have American and European friends in combat there that I've been in touch with, like in August with Malcolm Nance. 
and I was asked to teach casualty care skills. You know, I did general surgery and trauma surgery here in the Bay Area for over 40 years. I also did it in the military, um, and I was asked to, you know, do a humanitarian thing. You know, I'm not going to pick up a flak jacket, uh, a rifle, and go to combat. I'm a little past those days, uh, and I'm not an expert at that, but this is something I am an expert at. Um, it's called Advanced Trauma Life Support, ATLS. And in August 2022, I traveled to Ukraine to teach the first course. Uh, we were in the first group to go there. Uh, it was very interesting when they uh, got our group together for a little Zoom orientation. We all introduced ourselves to each other. And I kind of started laughing. I said, you know, we're all prior military. Uh, and I suspect that has something to do with them reaching out to us. We didn't know um, why we were picked or who these, these guys were. They reached out to the International Medical Corps, which is an NGO, a non-governmental charitable organization, which does tremendous work, reached out to us, along with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, uh, which I'm also familiar with. And they said, can you go teach ATLS? We want you to teach Ukrainian medical providers to manage acute injuries in the war zone. Um, it's sponsored by the American College of Surgeons. That's like my guild. You know, they're the ones who give us our board exams and certifications, and uh, they sponsor these courses and make sure the quality is correct. So, you know, I get, it's 12 hours from San Francisco to Warsaw, but of course I got to spend 18 hours on an airplane. And, you know, you fly over sort of the pole. I, I did a little blue line here from uh, the Bay Area where this arrow shows up uh, across to Warsaw where the red arrow is. Uh, and, you know, as you all taught in school, the closest distance from one to the other is not a straight line. It's over the pole. And that's always an interesting thing. And I, and I then caught a commuter uh, connection flight to this town that you see spelled here. And I went to the ticket desk and I said, how do you pronounce this? And she goes, it's Jezhov, just like it's spelled. Uh, here I am months later, still kind of laughing about that when I asked her how you pronounce it, Zhezhov. Okay, so, you know, I got to Warsaw, which you see here on the arrow. I took a commuter flight uh, down here to Zhezhov, just like it's spelled, near the Ukrainian border. Um, and we crossed the border. We got a van to the border, 90 minutes about, 60 minutes to walk through the border and go through immigration from both countries. We were met by a van on the other side. Why did we do it that way? Part of the reason was that the line of trucks at the border bringing supplies into Ukraine is miles and miles long. We would have been sitting there for more than a day. So we walk across, get another van. Uh, and then we go to Kyiv. And, uh, you know, I drew kind of a straight line here from Zhezhov to Kyiv. The fact of the matter is it took us about eight hours. Remember uh, President Biden's train trip, which, by the way, what a brave guy. Ten hour trip. Uh, we didn't go on a straight line. We took a lot of side roads because you don't want to be with those truck convoys because that makes you a potential target. So you kind of go off on the side roads and stay away from the big targets. Um, and so that we got our eight hour trip to Kiev dismounted. Um, and I immediately went out, asked my security guys what, what our limitations were and where can I walk around? So I went out walking around. Ukraine felt safe, but it was clearly a country at war. Uh, there were checkpoints and armed guards. There were fighting posts all over the place. Um, there were air raid sirens. You had to install an app on your phone so that you knew when there was incoming so you could seek shelter. And there were bomb shelters on the streets and in the schools and in the hotels and in the restaurants. Uh, when you drive there, remember I mentioned uh, there's checkpoints. So these checkpoints, they don't like you taking pictures because that's what the bad guys do when they're sizing you up. So I had to catch them on the fly. You'll see a couple of pictures here as we're driving. We're approaching a checkpoint and there's serpentine. So you see this truck is going to the left and then it's going to go to the right. That's how they get a chance to slow you down and take a look at you and see if they want you to stop and get out. Um, and when I got sightseeing, you know, I, everywhere I went, you know, I took notice of where the nearest shelter was in case I had to uh, get there behind, you know, because of a bomb coming in. And I went up to the cathedral where you saw President Biden walk with uh, uh, Zelensky and there's a lot of burned out, captured Russian equipment up there. Very interesting. Um, in that same square near the uh, cathedral, uh, they have a large statue there. It's been totally protected with sandbags and in order to try and preserve the cultural heritage. Because, you know, sometimes the Russians, you know, are blowing stuff up just indiscriminately for morale purposes. Um, it's unbelievable. Second time, a little different trip just to interject. 
I took, you know, from London to SFO to London, and then I went to Bucharest, Romania, a place that's never really been on my list. But then I got to go to Chisinau, Moldova, and I took a van to Odessa. Uh, this is the map. You can kind of see we flew to Bucharest, Romania. Then we uh, flew to Chisinau, Moldova. Then we took the van to Odessa. And you can see we are not too far from the creeping uh, battle zone, uh, which has been going back and forth in this area of Kherson and Nikolaev. So it was a little more um, noisy in that region and uh, a little more risky. But again, this was my second trip back in October. Uh, again, an exciting place to visit, lovely city. Um, but you know, the Russians are that far. You can see in these arrows. So here's Odessa. Russian forces are right there. And the Black Sea fleet you know, is closing off a lot of commerce through here, except what they want to let through. Um, so what is advanced trauma life support? Point of our two trips so far, and I'm getting ready for a third. This trains medical providers to manage acute injuries. It's sponsored and accredited and certified by the American College of Surgeons. They have control on this. Ukraine had never been yet cleared to have this course. We were the first guys who were going to teach an accredited course, and it was a big deal. Uh, it was introduced in this country in 1980 after an orthopedic surgeon had a plane crash. He felt his family was uh, not treated very well or conscientiously by the crews that picked him up. Um, and has been taught to over a million doctors and other medical professionals in 81 countries around the world. I have been an instructor since the mid 80s, uh, and I'm a national instructor and course director. So as were two or three of my fellow uh, instructors. What we do in ATLS is we focus on the first opportunity to assess and stabilize an injured patient. It provides a foundation of care for the injured, an algorithm that you can follow so that you do it the same way thoroughly every time. Uh, we also teach a common language so that we all know what we're talking about when we refer to a pneumothorax or to a whatever. It's we're common language, standard algorithm, uh, do it the same way every time. It's like training for anything. We hope that you go on autopilot when this happens. Uh, I use this particular algorithm for any emergency I see inside or outside of the hospital, trauma or anything, because it totally makes sense uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, it, it originally was talked about as care during the golden hour, but you know, if you're bleeding heavily, you might only have a golden five minutes to stabilize it. So uh, we don't use that term, but it, you may have heard it previously. So our lectures were didactic lectures. Uh, followed by hands-on skilled stations. You can see my interpreters here. I think after two or three courses, he could have given the course without me. Um, but he's, we always had an interpreter on our elbow. Uh, these guys were very, very, very good. All the slides had been translated into Ukrainian, and every night they double-checked them to make sure that nothing slipped through uh, that was not exactly what we were trying to get across. Again, you can see my, another interpreter is right there with me. Um, and we have a protocol language, which we had to translate into their language. It, we, I told you it's ABCs. It sounds simplistic, but it's necessary. We teach about airway. We teach about breathing. So airway is you know, making sure somebody's got an open airway. Breathing is that they're exchanging uh, lungs, working well. Circulation is OK. D is disability. Uh, e is exposure and environment. So this is the protocol language. Then we go on and teach a secondary survey. And in between all these things, we also teach skills for life-saving. Let's say the airway is occluded and you need to, to get the airway open. You know, we go over intubation, we go over surgical airways, things like that. Uh, those life-saving interventions, airways can be just with maneuvers or intubation. It could be a surgical airway. Uh, if you're having a B problem, a breathing problem, maybe you need a chest tube insertion for pneumothorax. Uh, so we teach all this stuff. On circulation, uh, we talk about pressure dressings and tourniquets and other tools, including, you know, resuscitation with fluid and blood. And, uh, you know, if you have to do a lifesaver, we say, go back and start over your ABCs from the beginning and make sure nothing changed. And, you know, for a couple of days of the course, we go over this stuff over and over until people really got it. And uh, after the lectures, we go to these hands-on skill stations. You can see my interpreter for this station's got his back to us. But again, he's right there with me. I've got four Ukrainian physicians. We're working on a mannequin. Um, and in this particular scene, you can see that I'm directing my student to do a surgical airway while the other students are watching. Again, in the blue shirt here is my interpreter, right, literally right by my elbow to make sure we're all uh, on the same 
thing. Uh, we also, when we weren't doing ATLS courses, we took a break. Um, we taught a course called Stop the Bleed. So I'm going to show you what we teach about that. That's a four-hour course that can be taught to non-medical people on how to stop bleeding with tourniquets and pressure dressings and wound packing. So I'm going to show you just a brief clip. Once life-threatening hemorrhage has been identified, immediately expose the wound and visualize the bleeding. Place direct pressure over the wound to begin to slow bleeding while opening the combat gauze. Remove the product and begin to place the gauze into the wound. It is important that you place the gauze deeply into the wound and into contact with the arterial or venous breach. Hurts, by the way. So this is a mannequin. Had it been a, um, an actual casualty, you might have heard a little background noise. Fact of the matter is we taught this to all kinds of people. We taught it to librarians and school teachers and bus drivers and station masters. I even had a landscaper from the university in my class. He said, you know, I want to know what to do. Uh, and everybody left with a, an emergency kit um, that had pressure dressings and a tourniquet and combat gauze and gloves that they could carry with them, uh, that they could put up in their place of work, take it with them on the bus if they're you know doing that. So um, we had a lot of people. So um, after I arrived, I got recruited for a side hustle. I got to tell you, this is, was kind of interesting because here I am in a country, I don't speak the language, I don't read, you know, I can't read the signs. Um, and remember this smiling guy, Malcolm Nance? Well, he was back in Ukraine in the East getting ready for a fight. And this is his game face. Um, we were on an encrypted app and he sent me a message and he said, you know, I've been out on patrol and we have a big event coming up, but we're, we're not getting our supplies fast enough. My medics need IV insertion needles, infusion tubing, resuscitation fluid. We've got a major offensive coming. I, I can't let my medics go out without the right gear. Uh, we've got to stabilize our wounded. Um, so with a bit of help from my interpreters, I scoured pharmacy and medical supply places in Kiev. And then I texted Malcolm when I had it all, said, I've got it. What do you want me to do? Is just stand by. Uh, a guy named Santa Claus will meet you at your hotel in an hour. Um, so I came with an Uber loaded with all the supplies from all the pharmacies that I picked up. And as I unloaded it onto the sidewalk, uh, Santa Claus showed up, loaded it into his van along with the other equipment that included drones and grenades and things in the back of his van, drove it to the front. 12 hours later, uh, I got a picture from the front from one of the medics holding up the stuff I had sent him, basically saying, thank you, you've saved lives. Um, I couldn't not help, right? Just... Uh, so that was my side hustle. But what did our ATLS teams accomplish? Well, our first five groups taught 150 doctors and nurses ATLS. 300 people completed Stop the Bleed. Everybody got a kit for bleeding control. They got a certificate of completion for both courses. Um, and, you know, I think it really felt like we had accomplished something significant. Some of the students were so focus. They said, I've got to know this. I've, I've got to know what to do. I've never had to do this before. That's And that's everybody. That's not just the doctors who are non-surgical specialties. That was, you know, the bus driver and the, and the school teacher, you know, they want to know how to protect their people. So very important. One of the students comes up after our class and he he, he kind of, you know, goes over what we had talked about. We about concentrating on that first hour post-injury, saving lives at immediate risk. We're chatting. And he says, you know, I'm going to uh, tell you what I think the purpose of ATLS really is. He says, I'm going to quote from the Talmud. And he eloquently quotes, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Now, I don't, not a book that I've read, but you know, I had heard that line and it took me a while to put my finger on it. Maybe some of you will remember this particular movie scene. It comes from Schindler's List. Hebrew from the Talmud that says whoever saves one life saves the world entire.
So I taught um, ATLS and I taught Stop the Bleed, but I learned a lot. Uh, the Ukrainians are a highly educated people. Uh, they're tech savvy and entrepreneurial. Uh, I have a colleague here who has a business in, in San Francisco, a startup. He's got 300 Ukrainian employees. He had 250 before the war. Now he has 300, a lot of them working remotely. Um, the younger generation is looking West and they mostly want to speak English. And, and you know, our culture is very important to them. Uh, they try to carry on a normal life in the face of adversity. You know, when we were out there, people on the streets, in the cafes, in the restaurants, the kids were going to school. Uh, the adversity is that you got to know where the bomb shelter is. The kids have to have a little bomb bag uh, so they can run for the uh, thing, uh, bomb shelter. They're very patriotic, as you're going to see. Some of those expressions of patriotism and solidarity, you've seen a few, but a lot of the buildings now have murals that talk about stand with Ukraine, tell you where to donate for certain group. Uh, I really like this one because it's one of the saints painted on the side of an apartment building and she's holding an anti-tank rocket. And, uh, you know, the Ukrainian soldiers responding to the Moscow, I already showed you that one. Um, you can see these around town. Uh, this is a new one that's come up recently where there's a Ukrainian kid in a judo class throwing an adult who looks just a little bit resembles uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia, doesn't it? Uh, it's really, a, you know, people are fighting back even with these little things like art on the buildings, right? So whatever they can do. Um, every generation has had examples of valor. I suspect a lot of you out there are my age peers and you recognize this one. This is the Marines raising the flag on Mount Suribachi. Um, during World War II when they invaded Iwo Jima, uh, a lot of valor uh, in this battle. Um, I think this is kind of the image that I like for today. President Zelensky is Jewish, his grandfather fought the Nazis, his relatives, many of them were killed in the Holocaust, but he's standing up to a dictator. Um, I, I think the guy's amazing, and, and I just am so impressed with his response. You know, when he was asked if he wanted to flee Ukraine, he said, no, send me more ammunition. Uh, and I think we need to. So we're going to talk a bit about that. Uh, I think he's this generation's Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill gave the greatest speeches of ever. I'm going to give you a clip from the one that I think is appropriate here. Never give in. Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Never yield to the overwhelming might of the enemy. I think Vladimir Zelensky channels uh, Winston Churchill. But what I really learned is that their kids are amazing. Um, so I'm going to show you some advice from students at a middle school that um, they're 13 to 15 years old. Think back to your kids when they were in middle school. And then listen to these kids. Generation who uh, has to uh, promote it to develop our country after the war. Soldiers now are fighting in the south and east of Ukraine. And we have to fight here. We have to develop our skills. We have to make a future and a history for our country. It's something that's happening right now. It's a real crime, a real genocide, and you cannot forget about it. People need to remember people have to care and it's not something that only affects Ukrainians it's something that will sooner or later affect the whole world if you don't help us now you'll be the next you'll be the next who will be in the war with this evil who has arisen from the ashes of your indecision so decide now or you just you will need to fight with this on your own land it's just excruciating to see people dying because of their nationality, because they are Ukrainians. So you just, you don't need that. So help us now. I'm just awed by their kids. Um, you know, these kids are 13 to 15, speaking pretty much flawless English. I heard one little minor grammatical thing in there. Um, and I get asked sometimes, you know, I give lectures on war and politics and um, a lot of terrible things, disaster management, uh, pandemic preparation. How can I be optimistic? People ask me, why am I still optimistic? I think it's because 
really the next generation gives me a lot of hope, just like with those kids you saw. I want to show you one more example. These kids practicing for choir in the basement under candlelight. They have to be in the shelter. Over the last few weeks, they rehearsed in Kyiv, at times practicing in a bomb shelter without electricity. Their impromptu performance last week nearly bringing Grand Central Terminal to a standstill. This classic song of the season. Today, a song of survival. Ukraine's Shedrick Children's Choir performing Carol of the Bells today at New York's Carnegie Hall. The holiday favorite, written by a Ukrainian composer, premiered here a century ago. Carol of the Bells, its message of good tidings, now ever more meaningful for this chorus. The kids give me hope. Today, proving joy and hope can prevail. As many of you have taken my classes, uh, you know, my talks always have. Now are we done? No, actually, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. We've got to talk to another real historian, Timothy Snyder. Very important. He says, and one, again, I'm paraphrasing, just like I do editing on the videos. If none of us is prepared to die for freedom, then all of us will die in unfreedom. We must be prepared for courageous acts. If we are passive rather than acting with courage, we will be easy targets. Which brings me to my favorite movie. Here it is. The welcome extra fight. This time I know our side will win. All of us need to be active in this fight at some level. Each of us can do something that is within our capability, that's within our um, abilities um to support the ukrainian people so those kids have a country they can rebuild slava ukraine so that's the end of my prepared remarks uh, i'm open to your questions i see we've got probably a couple in the chat room and uh we'll let's uh go ahead and uh take our chat room questions so is the sound on? I hope so, because we just did an hour. Uh, Adrian says yes. Um, all right. I love Malcolm. Is it possible to ask a question? Yes, uh, and an outstanding. If anybody has questions, I'm, I'm game. Uh, let me know. Um, I think I will hang out for a few minutes and see what uh, everybody thinks or wants to do and uh if not you know some of you have my email you're welcome to get in touch and let me know what you're thinking what you want to do dr baker i'm ready what was your assessment of the level of training of the medical professionals in your grant well, you know, I, I met people who were, you know, mostly hospital doctors, and they were fairly sharp. Big difference is they don't have a lot of the stuff that we take for granted technologically. Um, and so, you know, for but the things that we were teaching were pretty basic. So, you know, it wasn't very, there was no problem teaching ATLS or Stop the Bleed to, to our students. They were quite up to speed and quite a few of them actually knew it they just didn't know it in the format that we were teaching it uh, but their hospitals are a little more austere than ours 
there, there's no question uh, that, you know, that there's a, um, a, a little bit of a technological gap. And, and now, you know, with a thousand hospitals damaged and 140 or something destroyed, uh, they're going to have to really, really work on, on getting their country back to a better place. So, um, you know, I think it's it's going to be a, a big slog for them. It's going to take years to rebuild their country. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, take look at documentaries of, of you know, say Berlin after World War II, and we pretty much bombed pretty much to dust. That's what they're going to have to do. So good question. I think they're very well trained. I think they're very smart. Uh, all the people I dealt with were great. Uh, I see a question from Donna asking, do you think any accurate information is getting through to the public in Russia? Uh, some of it's getting through, but I think a lot of people uh, don't really believe it. Just, you know, uh, they believe what they want to believe. We have people in this country with the same problem. Um, and the question that, that follows that is interesting from Jessica. How do you respond to Americans um, who are buying into Putin's propaganda? Well, Again, I, I gave you a set of facts. I can back them up pretty easily. Uh, I think there are people in this country who respond to whatever it is they feel like they want to respond to. Um, how can we help financially and by writing letters to people from Carolyn? Actually, those are two good ways. There's a lot of ways. One is conversations uh, with people who, who don't get it. Um, letters to your representatives in Congress to continue. <laughs> support Ukraine. And of course, financial donations, either to um, those who are supplying uh, supplies for the fight, or sometimes just to NGOs who are taking care of all those refugees. Um, there's a lot of, of stuff to do. Uh, another great question. These are, you guys are terrific, making me think hard. I, I like it. Jeffrey, why war is hell, but why does so many in Congress oppose doing all we can do to support? You know, it's very interesting. The party that used to be anti-Russia uh, anti-autocracy suddenly has embraced it. And it has something to do with the prior president and his relationship to Vladimir Putin. It, it's a very um, distressing thing to me uh, that he tried to take NATO apart and blackmail Ukraine and otherwise bring them down. Um, you know, we don't have time for another grand jury, but I, I suspect there's a lot more there than meets the eye. Um, from Mary, if I wish to support the Ukrainian people, where would I be able to meet, make the most impact? Well, you're going to, there's a lot of ways. Like I said, whether it's emails or letters to your representatives to give unwavering support to Ukraine, uh, if you're talking financial donations, it can be anything from finding a group that is getting, you know, night vision goggles for people in the Ukrainian uh, fight or you know, I support some of the groups that are humanitarian that do refugee resettlement. I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of people uh, flowing into our neighborhoods. They're going to need somebody to help them get settled. You know, I personally also like World Food Kitchen, World Central Kitchen. I think Chef Andres deserves the Nobel Prize. When I was in Ukraine, World Central Kitchen was there feeding people, which I thought was very impressive. Um, Fred asked me, do I think we should give the Ukrainians F-16s or would that escalate the war? Uh, I think we should give them everything they want that is within the ability of, of them to utilize in this conflict. What I would do, because it's going to be easier for them to learn on Soviet equipment that they learned on in the first place. Remember, flying a fighter is not like driving a car. It takes a year. Um, you know, we can give our F-16s to Poland and Czechoslovakia, and, and they can give their MiGs to the Ukrainians. Uh, so there's ways to, to get around this. I'm, I'm sure it's in progress. Hopefully we don't put everything that we like to do out there uh, in front of everybody. Um, Kate wants to share this with others. Can we get a copy? Uh, I'm going to have Daniel answer that uh, to all of you at some point. I suspect it will be on the board for Ollie, am I right? Yeah, we're going to put it on our front page of our, I mean, it's going to be on our Ali website page under events. So once this is done recording, we will save it onto there uh, for you. Very good. Um, so I mentioned uh, several organizations Jerry is asking about, uh, like I said, I you have to find the one that meets what you feel is good. I, I tend not to promote donations to certain organizations, one, because I don't want to show favoritism. And once or twice, some of those organizations have turned out to fall on their face. Um, why was Zelensky adamant the day before the invasion that Russia would not invade? 
you know, it, it is amazing in retrospect because uh, the day that they put out the intelligence that the Russian um, field hospitals were having blood delivered was the day I knew for sure that the attack was 24 to 48 hours away. I think they simply didn't believe it. They were in shock that, you know, with all the stability in the world, with the United Nations and the, you know, the accords in 1994 guaranteeing security, you know, why would he do this? It's crazy, right? Well, um, given the delay from Edward is a question. Given the delay training and preparing the Ukrainians, it seems that the emergency medical training can handle now. What are your thoughts about the difference in, between uh, compelling difference to urge our government and military to focus on the training? There's a lot of groups doing a lot of stuff. Um, and, and I can't go into too much detail, but I suspect that we've been training the Ukrainians extensively since 2014 uh, when the Russians invaded Crimea and Donetsk. Uh, so I don't think this is new. Uh, would I like to see us move a little faster? Yes, uh, it's, it's, very, um, it's very difficult. Christine asks, how can they best receive medical needs on the fly? Uh, a lot of people are, are sending things there. Again, you can look for your humanitarian groups that do that stuff. Uh, um, there's a lot of them if you want to contribute to a charity. And again, I'm not going to, for you and Patricia, I'm probably not going to push too many um, different charities, but there's a lot of good ones. I mean, International Medical Corps that sent me there, uh, I, I think is a deserving one. And like I said, uh, World Central Kitchen is fabulous, but you know, there's a lot of good. Um, Valerie, thank you for the compliment. Um, everything you do can make a difference, Judy. You asked, what can I do? Whether it's a conversation with somebody who's an anti-vax, oh, but wrong subject, conversation with somebody who's pro-Putin and thinks we should abandon Ukraine, just remind them that, um, you know, once Ukraine, if Ukraine were to fall, then Moldova would fall, and next thing you know, uh, some other place would be under attack, and maybe it would be us too. Um, Jeffrey's commenting about uh, the probability of nuclear war. I think it's very low, and I'll tell you why. I spent a year assigned to U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha, which is one of those Dr. Strangelove places where you're watching the Russians and everybody, all our other adversaries, and you're calculating where the bombs would fall and which way the fallout would go. And it's very interesting. Uh, I always like to remind people that nuclear fallout blows pretty much in every direction. So you might, you know, do something terrible in Ukraine, but guess what? It, it's going to find its way to Moscow. Um, it's not a good thing. It would pretty much be the end of the world to do that. So um, Carolyn says, I was fortunate to visit the Olympics in October uh, and heard Ukraine is fighting for all of us. You know, that's the way the Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and the Poles, why do you think the Poles who have some traditional enmity with the Ukrainians are suddenly grateful to the Ukrainians? They took in over a million refugees overnight, which is incredible. Um, you know, they the Poles know that the Russians will be coming for them next. So, um, you know, let's see, make sure I didn't miss one. I want to send some um, money to the Ukrainians. How do I do that? How do I go directly to their assistance? Um, you know, maybe Daniel and I can have a conversation. We can think about how we can get that information out to everybody. Like I said, I don't support a lot of charities directly, but, you know, it's also indirect, like the International Medical Corps. How prepared is the U.S. military, knowing how vulnerable the USA is? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. I, I think we are very prepared, but it's a different era. And in this era, a lot of it depends on our allies. And suddenly our allies woke up. Germany, which has been sort of on the peace part of the graph, um, hasn't done much with their military the last 75 years. They just put $100 billion into it and making military service uh, a crucial part of their uh, country's policy. And all these other countries are, uh, you know, um, stepping up. Uh, but you gotta remember if you have, uh, um, you know, a couple million people in a small country in a Baltic state, they're not gonna front too many troops, but, you know, together united all these countries with the US and with, with the rest of the NATO allies, is, is a very strong group of people. Uh, what we really need, 
Marty, I'm not sure I understand your question about what is happening with Ukraine, um, but I think, uh, you, you know, I, I think it's this is going to grind on for a while. And uh, I think if we're lucky, maybe there'll be a change of command soon. Brian asked, do I think Putin may be insane? No, I think he's a little bit of a narcissist. Uh, he reminds me of a former president, only I think he's a lot smarter. Uh, he's also in an echo chamber, only surrounded by supporters. And I think that's always a bad place to be intellectually when you're making decisions. Um, but I'm hoping for a change of command. Um, have there been any changes of command? Yeah, well, there have been some generals that have lost their jobs, but I think uh, Putin needs to lose his job. Um, think about Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book, the story of the wolf that was the leader of the pack. When he failed to catch his prey, eventually the other wolves turned on him. So I suspect, um, you know, it's going to be going to require a change of command. And I think the other wolves are going to have to put him down. Um, that, that's my hope, if we're lucky. That doesn't mean you can't get somebody worse, but we'll see. What would be considered a Ukrainian victory? Uh, I would think that's going to be up to the Ukrainians to decide. My preference would be that they get Donetsk and Luhansk back in their possession. I'm not sure what to say about Crimea, um, but I think it's the Ukrainians have to make that decision. They, they're, you know, been fighting for their lives, and and unlike other wars where we kind of made the decision for our allies, you know, we need to make sure the Ukrainians make this decision. Um, Karen put out there that you can look at charitynavigator.com or charitywatch.com. Great suggestions. Um, do I see an increase in our own military production? Christine, great question. I'm glad you asked it. And I want to point out two things with this. Yes, uh, we had places that made things like artillery shells that these factories were, you know, very slowed down. We, we've lost a lot of our ability to, you know, ramp this stuff up and, and get it out quickly, but we're ramping it up. And when we vote money, for Ukraine, let's say, you know, they voted several billion dollars and they say, okay, we're going to send 150 Bradley fighting vehicles. Um, what that means is we're going to take that money and we're going to make 150 Bradleys here in this country, which means American jobs and the American economy. And, you know, we're going to send those Bradleys to Ukraine. So although we sometimes give money, a lot of times what we use that money that we budgeted to pay for the stuff that we're giving them. Um, so yes, we're ramping up military production. Countries in Europe are waking up and doing their thing. And we got a long way to go because uh, we have other countries, allied countries like South Korea, that's ramping up production as well. Because um, you know we've been kind of sitting on our laurels. Um, Jessica asks, is there legitimacy to the rumors Putin has cancer? I wouldn't believe a word of it, but we'll find out someday. Um, you guys are great questions. Um, do I think China will join Putin's request? Well, if China joins Putin's re request, and you can all sort of answer this question if you think about it, how are we going to respond? Well, we're going to probably maybe maybe inflict some pain on China with a trade embargo. Uh, what would that do to China's economy and ours, by the way? Uh, besides emptying the shelves at Walmart, you know, because we're very linked into their production. Um, we, we've got to really think this one through because whatever we do to China is going to boomerang back on us and, and be, be hurtful. Uh, do I think China will join? It might. You know, it, they're going to do what's in their best interests. Uh, and it's probably not in their best interest to help in more than with just a pat on the back. Carolyn asks, any comments on the Wagner Group? You know, it's a gang of criminals. Uh, they take convicts out of prison and give them guns. That's a fairly scary thing. Uh, they're better soldiers, better paid, better trained than the average Russian conscript. Uh, they're a threat. They've been fighting in Syria. They got groups in Africa. Uh, they're terrorists, basically, uh, under the pay of the Russian government. It's a great question. Um, how about to encourage other countries to support the economic boycott of Russia? So India, China, Brazil are all buying Russian oil. They're keeping the war alive because they're feeding money into the Russian economy that they wouldn't otherwise get. Um, we're going to have to find a way to leverage that. But you know, India and China and Brazil and other countries like South Africa that are playing footsie with the Russians over their oil, you know, it's in their best interest to do so. And that's kind of why they're doing it. Um, so, 
you know, I, I think I'm sure we're trying to figure out a way to get them to stop, but it's going to be very hard. Is our military being depleted by sending resources? Absolutely not. Everything we send, uh, we're building more, making more, and uh, I don't think we're depleted. Uh, we had way too much stuff to start with, um, except there are certain devices that, you know, maybe you don't have hundreds of thousands of, like, you know, some of the shoulder fire rockets and stuff have to be geared up and made again. Um, what do I think of Putin's excuse that Ukraine started this with the attack of Donbass? Well, Donbass is part of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine didn't attack, the Russians invaded. So, you know, just like Sergei Lavrov at the G20, it's a laughable, nonsensical BS excuse. Um, so Donna mentions that Western democracies now review their military preparedness. And, and yeah, and not only that, but our alliances, you know, NATO, was really on the rocks. People thought NATO might actually break up uh, because of the, you know, sort of just inertia of the last 75 years. And then you add to it the former president attacking it. Um, Sheila points out we own China billions of dollars in debt. Yeah, they hold our paper. Um, you know, and you know why they hold our paper? Let's go back. Um, you know, the global war on terror where we fought in Iraq and we fought in Afghanistan, two wars that were totally BS uh, and made no sense. We're all run on credit. The US government did not collect any taxes unlike every other war. You know, World War II, you had war bonds, you had increased income tax, uh, all those things to finance the war. We didn't finance the war, we took it on credit and then we sold the paper to the Chinese. It's a great way to make sure the public stays behind it. Had we raised taxes, we would have been out of those two countries a lot faster where we were getting our heads handed to us anyway. Um, Ed Cruz, I um, find it useful to imagine looking back from the future, uh, look at the time and see Germany with the 1938 with Hitler. Oh, absolutely. There's no question that if you give you give Hitler, you know, a little bit of Czechoslovakia and a little bit of Austria, uh, that just whets his appetite. So we didn't say much when Putin invaded Georgia in, in 2008. You know, we didn't say much when he invaded uh, and took over Donbass and Luhansk in 2014. That's where we should have stopped them. Uh, but nobody had the courage. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, if Just like those kids say, if you don't stop them now, you'll be fighting that evil in your own neighborhood someday. So yeah, it's it's a very important parallel. And you know, just I just uh, want to, great questions. Can't thank you all enough. I know I've gone a little past my hour. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, is anyone teaching STB? This is for Mary in the US. American College of Surgeons has been teaching STB. Uh, this course came about right after the Sandy Hook shooting because there were some victims who died due to exsanguination who could have been saved if somebody knew what to do. And yeah, it's taught around the US and you will also see uh, in airports and train stations and other places, schools, uh, just like you see those defibrillators. You're going to start to see STB kits with a, an instruction chart. Um, you know, I think uh, you're, you're, you're going to start noticing it a little bit more. Um, so thank you. Somebody mentioned, I think we need a flat tax on everyone. Not an economist. I'll, I'll defer to my friends. Um, how long can Ukraine last against the Russian onslaught? Don, what a great question. And the answer is they'll never give up. Even if the Russians capture the country, the Ukrainians will be in the hills. The Ukrainians will be in the forests. They'll never give up. Never, never. Um, so Christine talks about CERT. Great program. Yes, uh, CERT is an emergency response for your community. And uh, every community has one. You can Google it. Uh, thank you. I'm going to call this our, our last chat question. And I'm going to call it a day and let you all um, head off to go do whatever <laughs> I want to thank you all very much uh, for your time and efforts. And if you support Ukraine, great. And like I said, you can be supportive just by keeping the conversation going and making sure that Americans uh, don't, you know, cut them loose and, and uh, give up on them. I think it's so important to us to uh, keep supporting them 100%. So again, thank you all. And I'm going to say goodbye. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker, for this presentation. It was very, very educational and informative. I do want to share my screen real quick so everyone's aware that on campus, if you want to keep the conversation going, 
Um, we'll be sending this out via email. I know we're sending a lot of emails right now, but we want to make sure you are engaged. This is actually happening on campus, Challenges and Visions of Hope from the People of Ukraine by filmmaker Rick Ray. Uh, it's on March 16th, so next Thursday from 12 to 1.30 at the Petit Salon. So if you're interested in attending that and coming to the campus, uh, there'll be film clips, food, and a discussion to broaden your awareness and support the people of Ukraine. Uh, so we'll be sending this out. So we want to just uh, know that there's more education available to you. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Baker. This was very informative. Uh, it caught me, kept me engaged to stay on. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. And um, we this is perfect time. We're going to the Museum of Tolerance this Thursday with a sold out uh, 50 students. Um, and we have other uh, events coming up, uh, like the Nixon Museum in April. And uh, in May, we're going to have a three-part seminar series on the history of our campus land. We received a grant for that, uh, thanks to our finance uh, committee of volunteers. So thank you for that, and we'll keep, keep you informed. Take care, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Baker. Roger that.